good morning, good morning. Uh, thank you again for the invitation. I'm really excited here. Hello, everyone. Um, well, welcome, and I'm going to try to present and give you um, some views about the, the application of this, uh, this other anisotropic NMR parameter called residual chemical shift anisotropy to the analysis of small molecules. Um, um, let me see here. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, so recently, uh, with uh, in collaboration with Armando Navarro Vázquez, we published uh, this article in Angevante, uh, in which uh, we propose computer-assisted 3D structure elucidation of natural products using residual dipolar couplings. So these these are the results of probably eight years of work. So we started this idea about five years ago. We presented the first results in in um, in the uh, smash in uh, um, Santiago de Compostela. Uh, so the idea behind this uh, paper is that you use NMR data, molecular formula, and then you combine this with a computer-assisted stretch elucidation software, a case, then you can get molecular constitution, then uh, with molecular constitution you generate 3D structure by DFT, molecular mechanics, then you do configurational analysis, and then you do automatic superposition of structure using the single tensor approximation. And in one shot, you know, from here to here, you get the determination of the relative configuration just uh, without human intervention. You can extend this concept to ECD or, um, or VCD. Oh, sorry, it says VCD. Uh, I say CD twice. Uh, and then you can get absolute configuration. Um, Carlos. Carlos Cobas asked me yesterday, you know, to, to tell you there is a new version of um, NOVA coming soon, that is version 12, and then there will be two new tools there that are related to the talk, the talk today, and it's related in a certain way to the structure elucidation of small molecules. So um, if we have a molecular formula, and then we provide the, um, uh, the 1D proton carbon, HSUC, HMBC, carbon or, or nitrogen. Uh, so the, the one of the, the, new, the new module or plugin in MNOVA is going to be MNOVA XE. That is a structure elucidation that, uh, that will perform a structure elucidation based on case that is computer assisted structure elucidation. This program will generate uh, SDF files to the structures what we will call the molecular constitution that represents how the atoms are connected. It's, it's just a 2D structure. But there will be another module that I will tell you the name later in which you can draw the structure in 2D. And then after that, the program will interact with, um, with this um, um, uh, third-party store software that it will be in the module that's called Balloon. Balloon will generate 2 to, two to the n minus 1 configuration for n chiral centers, then it will interact with uh, GMMX and it will perform the conformational analysis and it will generate 2 to the n minus 1 conformational sets. Then uh, interacting with new chem, uh, it will perform DFT calculations and with DFT calculations it will calculate DFT geometries proton and carbon chemical shift, CSA tensors, and J-coupling. And then if you provide experimental data that it will be analyzed by MNOVA, like RDCs, RCSAs, NOE derived distance, chemical shift, and J-coupling, well, and RCSAs will not be incorporated yet, but the, 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 the next version we have uh, RDCs, NOE derived distance, chemical shift, and J-coupling, then you can perform a fitting of population to data with and then a potential overfitting problem will be treated using this archaic information criterion and the result will be a graphic like that with uh in which you will have all the the quality factors or the chi square and it will tell you which one is the the, the correct relative configuration so this module this module the name is Stereofitter, 
and will be a separate module and, and it will be a kind of, of plugin that you will have to pay for a, a separate license. And then so so then the, so then Nova Tool will have the structure elucidator and the stereo seat fitter and they can interact together. And um, also we are planning for the future that is we calculate electronic in CD or uh, vibrational CD in, in, and, then, and then we provide the experimental data performing the same feature in case, in, in case that, the, of course, we have to have the chromophore, we can get absolute configuration. So this is coming, guys, so I'm, I'm really, really excited about this idea. So let's go to um, NMR in isotropic medium. So we know now you already seen my my, um, my my trilogy about our disease. So you 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 have a sample. So if you put this sample in in a lyotropic liquid crystalline phase like PBLG, PLG, or in aligning gels, well we can we can see uh, these anisotropic NMR parameters. We can see residual quadrupolar couplings. We can see residual dipolar couplings. And we can see this relatively new for you uh, residual chemical shift anisotropy. Um, in the case of uh, residual quadrupolar coupling, well, look, you know, the natural abundance of deuterium is, um, is very low, is 0.015%. But uh, right now, how we use them? Well, we use the, the solvent peak. And the solvent peak that is 99.9% .9 of deuterium, we use the solvent peak to see if we generate or not an isotropy. Here you can see um, a gel, you know, that is in the compression device that is relaxed. This is a, this is a DMSO gel. This is a chloroform gel. And when you compress, you see the quadrupolar coupling. And, and now everybody knows after my, my webinars before that this is a good tool. And this is the first experiment you have to run in order to see if you really generate the anisotropy. It doesn't make sense to continue if you don't see this, this doublet. And the doublet will depend on the solvent you use. Um, so regarding residual dipolar couplings, I will just to summarize um, this, this methodology is mature enough uh, now to be applied in, 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 as a routine in the laboratory. Um, the gels will be commercially available soon by Mestre Labs. Uh, the, 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 the device can be already uh, purchased from Mestre or from Newer Enterprise. Uh, but uh, we can summarize that RDCs are easy to measure. So now we know that provide the relative orientation of internuclear vectors. Uh, these internuclear vectors can be proton-carbon one bonds or they can be proton-proton geminal couplings. Uh, they can be long-range proton-carbon RDCs, but of course these are one order of magnitude smaller. They are difficult to measure with this high accuracy. Uh, and what is the main limitation of residual dipolar coupling? Well, we need an H a C vector or an HH vector. So when we have molecules that are proton deficient, uh, that is, we, we we cannot really apply RDC. So, so if we have a molecule with a molecule with too many quaternary carbons, and we we need other tools. We need other tools, and probably that is in fact the idea that we're going to present today. Uh, what is the chemical shift tensor? The the chemical shift tensor is that you know that chemical shift is not a number. Uh, in fact, chemical shift is a tensor. And, 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 and the chemical shift depends on the orientation of the atom with respect to the magnetic field. But what we see in solution, we see um, the average that, for example, the frequency is gamma over 2 pi, B naught, and this is the famous equation of chemical shift in which this is what we call the, 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 the shielding constant. But this shielding constant in solution is a number, and this number is what we normally know, know as the isotropic shielding constant. And this isotropic shielding constant is just, you know, the weighted average, and not the, sorry, no, it's not the weighted average. It's just the average of the three values of the chemical shift tensor. So sigma 1, 1 plus sigma 2, 2 plus sigma 3, 3 divided by 3. Um, and it is important that, that we um, obey some conventions. So uh, there's, there's a kind of boring 
definitions here. Uh, for example, the absolute magnetic shielding. Well, what is the absolute magnetic shielding? The absolute magnetic shielding is what you get for when you calculate, for example, by DFD, and it's in ppm, and it's the distance uh, in shielding between the frequency of a bare nucleus, okay, and the frequency of the same nucleus of the species under investigation is, it, 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 in fact, well, if the nucleus is surrounded by electrons inside an orbital, it has a chemical shape. Well, a chemical shape wouldn't exist without the electrons anyway. Um, and then uh, the other thing is, uh, or the other concept is the, the chemical shift delta. And this is the chemical shift delta that we use every day in PPM. When, when we say, well, okay, acetyl group is at 2 ppm, a carbonyl is at 202 ppm, so it's, it's, it's respect to a reference. You know, you know we, we in organic chemistry we use, for, for example, for protons, we use TMS, now we use the solvent pick. Um, what is chemical shift and isotropy? Well, if you, if you represent, you know, the the tensor, this is the chemical shift tensor in which the, the values of sigma 1 1 and sigma 2 2 and sigma 3 3 are different. Here, this is a solid powder profile. So in solid state with all the orientation you get this profile. And this is sigma 1 with delta 1 1, this is delta 2 2, this is delta 3 3. But in solution, in isotropic solution, what do we see? Well, we see just the average. You know, we see these uh, three numbers Divide, the sum of the three numbers divided by three, and, and then we, we get what we call the isotropic chemical shift, the sigma is. But if we put the sample in an isotropic conditions, let's say a gel, or let's say a lyotropic uh, liquid crystalline, then the signal shift, and, and this shift is because now sigma 1, 1, sigma, no, sorry, sigma, well, uh, yeah, sigma 1, 1, 1, and sigma 2, 2, or sigma 3, 3 don't have the same weight because now the, the probability, the orientational probabilities of the molecules are not the same in all directions and these slightly change in probabilities create this shift and this shift is what we call residual chemical shift and isotropy. Um, what is the maximum value of this residual chemical shift and isotropy? Well, the maximum value is, if we look at the center here, is this, is this distance. So this distance will be sigma 3, 3 minus sigma iso. But in, in, the, in, in, in an isotropic condition, for example, a gel, we need to consider the global degree of order. So if the order is just 1 in 1,000, then the value is 10 to the negative 3. So, so in order to see what will be the maximum value that we should expect, it's pretty simple. So that is the equation. Then a PMMA gel, for example, 0.2 molar percent of cross-link density has a GDO of 0.7 10 to the negative 4. This is normally the, the degree of alignment. So if we consider a, a carbonyl or an aromatic group in which that distance is 200 ppm, then multiplying 200 ppm and scaling it down by the degree of alignment, we get, we see that probably the maximum RCSA that we will see is 0.14 ppm. And, you know, and, and at, at 125 megahertz, this is a 500 megahertz in proton instrument, the maximum value is 17.5 hertz. And if we have a CH3 group, a C, in a CH3 group is um, 20 ppm. And so the maximum value for a CH3 group is just 1.7, you know, 75 hertz. Well, the conclusion is that RCSAs are very small. And since RCSAs are very small, you know, we need to measure them in, in high resolution mode. So the only way right now to do it is we need to run a 1D carbon-13 spectrum where we have a good resolution in Kurzberg's points in order to work in ranges of, you know, 0 to 100 ppbs. And why carbon NMR? Well, um, carbons are in the inner core of the molecule and they are insensitive to solvent effect. So the chemical shift tensors that we need to calculate in order to perform the fitting can, can be calculated accurately now. 
Uh, but if we can do the same with Proton, we could. There was a nice presentation at the Smash last year by Nilo, Nila Monina, and with Christian Gris in a group. But you can see then the problem is that calculating them is, dif is difficult because you cannot predict all the interaction of the proton with the solvent. So, so right now we have to stick to carbon and, then, and it works well. Um, let's go back to 2011. So uh, RCSAs have been used in protein and MR. I haven't seen them you know, as often as RDCs. But uh, in a small molecule, we have the same problem. We need alignment media in organic solvent. So this paper uh, in, that, in, that you can see, the, the, the authors here, in which uh, is um, Christina Thiele, Ilya Kuprov, uh, Anne Ulrich, and Burkhard Louis, what they propose is they propose to put a gel, you know, a stretch, inside um, a rotor for a variable angle um, probe. And then by changing the angle, you can scale the, the value of RDCs or the value of the residual chemical shift and isotropy as a function of the cosine squared theta. So what they did is they collected RDCs and they measured these uh, changes in carbon chemical shift. Using the RDCs, what they did is they calculated an alignment tensor and then they predicted the values of the chemical shift. And what they did is they compared the predicted versus the calculated, and they and then they show a nice linear relationship. They they are correlated, and this was a proof that well RCSAs can be measured in small molecule, but that's it. So that was it was shown that it can be done. Uh, mm, 2010, Burkhard Louis proposed this stretching device. This stretching device is a device just to stretch a gel inside the tube. And with that device, uh, and they performed this work in which, uh, the, you know, Fernando Halvas, uh, Manuel Smith, Hansun, Adam Mansur, uh, Kumer Leve was a, was a student by Burkhard Louis. Arma, my colleague Armando Navarro, Christian Grisinger, and Uber, you know, Reinschall. So what they did is they tried to measure RCSAs in, in this device, but there were some problems there, but still they, they, the paper was published. They produced and then they proposed the concept, but using only RCSAs, they couldn't discriminate, for example, the, the structure of strong versus the structure of epistrom, and they had to combine with RDCs. Um, in 2010, there is this article by Yi Su Liu, who now works uh, for Merck, in the group of uh, Thomas Williamson, and he's there with also Gary Martin, and, and so he proposed this device that is a device in which you can put a gel here, and, and then you, you put this part in the magnet, in the coil, you have to put it upside down. And, and then you can measure um, a carbon chemical shift. Then you can push it, and then you stretch it in this narrow part. And then what, by stretching, you create an isotropy. And then taking the difference, you can measure uh, um, the chemical shift in carbon and, or, and, and dif dif the difference, uh, the delta of delta. Uh, so this method was proposed and to measure residual dipolar couplings and also um, residual chemical shift and isotropy. Um, well, um, the problem is that if I go back, so the problem that in this paper, is since it was not shown that it was possible, so um, well, this delay in certain way the development. But uh, we had this device. Uh, Christian Griesinger approached me some time ago and asked me for gels, and so Nilamoni Nach has been working. But at the same time, uh, the the group from Merck. Uh, by Jesus proposed, also he was convinced that it could be used with organic solvent. So almost simultaneously, they 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 got results. We had results, and then we published this very nice paper in 2016, in which we show that the determination of relative configuration using chemical shift and isotropy only is possible. So this paper created a lot of enthusiasm, and yeah, well, we show it. So, uh, but let me, let, me, let me tell you, in fact, what was the main problem? 
The number one problem when measuring RCSAs <coughs> are the isotropic shift interference. Well, let's let's see. So if you if you have um if you run an NMR in solvent A and then you change the sample to solvent B, then you get an you 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 observe an isotropic shift. And we that when we work in NMR, we know that we cannot compare, you know, uh spectra, you know, running two different solvents. So if we want to, for example, verify structure, we know that if we have the, the NMR data in methanol, we have to run in methanol to know if it is a structure. Well, this is a, this is what we what we what I would call here isotropic shift. So if you have a solvent, you know, you run in your compound in a solvent, and then you put in in a solution of that solvent with an LLC phase. This LLC phase, for example, PBLG, is already an isotropic. So then you see you see both. You see the isotropic shift, same as here, because you are changing the environment. But then you will see RCSAs and you will see RDCs. But RDCs are easy because RDCs, you know, is the difference between a J and a J plus, plus uh, D. But here you have two chemical shifts and how do you deconvolute them? How do you know which part correspond to the isotropic shift and which part correspond to the, to the RCSA? It's, it's very difficult or almost impossible. If you have a solvent, and then, and then you put your compound in a, in a gel, swollen with that solvent. You have an you you, you will see an a isotropic shift. Then, if you compress the gel, for example, then you will see isotropic shift plus RCSA. But this uh, this uh, isotropic shift is observed in compressed gels, but it's not observed in stretch gels. So when when Yisu Liu perform his RCSA studies at Merck, he didn't have to do any correction. So so the, the first observation it was easy for them and then they did the fitting and they got the structure. In our case we had a problem and the problem was that as you compress the gel then you increase you increase the density of of gel by volume and there is a linear isotropic shift that is that is added to the residual chemical shift and isotropy and since it is linear that can be corrected and when we figure that out then you know, now we solve the problem so the same gel if you put the see you put your compound in the same gel let's, let, let's see we we put the compound in the gel then we do not compress the gel and then and then from relax we go to compress in in both conditions then we will see the RCSAs building and we will see a predictable isotropic shift that can be corrected. Um, and as I, as I said, uh, if you do, uh, if you use the same gel but you go from relax to a stretch, you see only RCSA. So there is, there is no question that there is a big advantage of stretching yeah, and because when you stretch, you get purely RCSAs. Um, here, for example, this is this is the, the uh, <laughs> I'm laughing because, in fact, you know, sometimes I, I, would, I said, well, I never dare to run a carbon NMR before in the gel because I thought it would be very crappy, but it's not. You know, you see, this is a carbon, carbon spectrum inside a gel. Of course, these are the background, the background signal from the gel. This is the chloroform. This is the carbonyl of the PMMA. But then you have very, you see very sharp, carbons and then if you if you expand this this is inside the compression device then you see two signals per per carbon well one of the signal the smaller is the isotropic solution outside the gel and the other signal is the isotropic solution inside the gel but if you compress the gel and then you will see that the isotropic signal almost stay but then you see the shift, see, the shifts here for carbon-12, for carbon-3, for carbon-10, and then you see, and this, this shift, oh, sorry, this shift is linear. And, but if you try to fit your data to, that, to those shifts in case of the isotropic, um, in case, sorry, of the compression device, uh, you don't get a good fit. Um, so, uh, 
in in the work that we have done, uh, so what do you need to do RCSAs? Well, you need to just take a um, standard carbon NMR, but the key the key here is that both both you know conditions that said relax or stretch or non let, let's say isotropic and anisotropic they need to be performed in same chemical environment. That is why it is possible with the gels because you do it, you know, in the gel relax and then in the gel compress. In principle, in the gel relax and in the gel compress, the, con the chemical conditions are the same. Well, they are the same for a stretch, but they are slightly different and predictable for compress. So here you can see that, uh, for example, carbon-15 is the less anisotropic carbon, and then you can use that one as a reference, but for carbon-13 here you see a, an RCSA of minus 4.4. For carbon-1, that is aromatic, that is, that is, expected, that is expected, you can see um, an RDC of, sorry, RDC, uh, an RCSA of minus 17.8. So this is done between two uh, compression degrees, 17 hertz and 51 hertz of quadrupolar coupling. But as you can see, they're very small. Even the, even the highest is very small. So you have to be careful. You have to measure these in good condition. You have to get a, you have to have a good shimming, and you have to you have to have a good resolution. So normally, what I do is I I, I take the carbon with 64k and a long acquisition time. Um, well, uh, coming back to the devices, uh, we have two reliable devices to do our CSA measurement. One is the compression device, and you go from minimum to maximum, and then you take two, two, two measurements, two carbon in the mark. In this case, this is the, um, you have to use the gels with 0.3% molar concentration of cross-linker, but in the other case, in the case of the stretching device, normally the concentration of the um, the concentration of the cross linker has to be smaller so in the in the um, what we call the wider part of the device the gel has to swell in order to touch the wall and then you come you you press you press it and you uh, stretch it and these are the two methods right now available um, uh, here I can show you for example for strong and then here are the, is the isotropic signal, and these one are the, the the changes in chemical shift due to chemical shift um, uh, and isotropy. Uh, and then once you measure, then what do you do? Well, you need you need it's, it's exactly the same. It's it's not different from doing RDCs. You can use M spin or a stereo filter in the future, and then you need to generate all your possible options, all your possible structures. And then, and then, but you have to do one more calculation. You need to calculate the chemical shift tensors for each carbon using DFT. Then, uh, you provide the experimental RCSAs in a table, then, and then, then the, the fitting is performed, you, you back calculate, and then you compare the calculated versus experimental, and then you also obtain a quality factor, and the lowest quality factor should be the correct structure. It's not, not different from what we do with RDCs. Um, for MSPIN, here, you know, you have an input table. So the input table is, uh, you have a CSA data, um, and then, then you you get you get CSA data, and then you have the carbon, and the and the um, uh, RCSA in in hertz. And then you tell which which of your carbons is the reference. This is for strong. Uh, you can you can uh, combine, and then you can fit RCSAs and RDCs. That was already proposed uh, in, in the paper by uh, Fernando Halva said out. Oh, the one of strong, it was already proposed that you can fit to a unique tensor. Well, in principle, <clears throat> the tensor from a, C, from a fit into RCSA should be the same as the tensor from RDC, but they are not exactly the same. And the reason is that, well, you have error, and you have more error when you measure carbon chemical shift, 
and the Q factors also are normally higher for RCSA than for RDCs because measure those values accurately is more difficult. But it's, it can be done, and in MSPIN you can fit to RDCs, you can fit to RCSAs, in a stereo fitter will be the same, or you can fit to both combined. Um, okay, here coming back to the example of strong from the paper, well, here, if you do, if you perform the fitting without the correction, you have a Q factor of 0.5. But if you, if you, have, if you make this correction, that it can be done. And um, well, I don't have much time here to show. I just want to show you the the, the, the big picture. Um, then, then if you make the correction in in MSPIN, uh, that you had to provide, you had to provide with the distance between isotropic and anisotropic, and there is another parameter that you add. You don't need to do this with the stretching device, and and then I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna I'm not gonna show you this. This is just the equation, the paper. But what I want to show you is the fitting without the isotropic correction and the fitting with the correction. So you can tell, see, 0 0.5, 0 0.1. And now it was possible to do it. So here we are all happy, correct structure, run structure, done with the compression device, as I'm telling you that if you do it with a stretch, and you don't need to perform this correction. And but you can see the changes, see? The without the isotropic correction is 0.5 and 0.6, with the isotropic correction is 0.1 and 0.4. Um, so uh, what happened here? Well, this picture here shows you that these are all the tensors in in the aromatic ring. So these are the 3-3 the, the three, three component here. And as you see, this looks like a nice cage. And this is the tensor for the carbonyl. So when you are, when you are changing the configuration on, on, on carbon 17, and then you, you, you epimerize this, what you are changing is the relative orientation of the tensor. So in fact, the, um, the parameter that allows you to discriminate one compound from the other, just running RCSAs, is the relative orientation of these two tensors. And these are very strong because these are sp2. And the, the analysis was also done for strengthening. We already did it with menthol. And also something that it is nice to show is that, that the, if you use the stretch and you compare with the compress or a strong, the, um, the values are anti-correlated. But in fact, going from a stretch to compress is like rotating the gel inside the magnet 90 degrees. So there are no, dif be careful, there are not two different tensors. These two tensors are just correlated. It's the same tensor that is just rotated and it's scaled by cosine square of theta. So the, the, the summary here is that we were able to show that using compression or stretching, we were able to show that we could determine strychnine, strong, mephalokin, and menthol. Uh, so let me tell you some facts. I would like to show you some examples. I don't have much time, but uh, uh, RCSAs are useful for proton deficient molecules where you don't have enough CH vector. It's ideal for molecules containing, a, 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 sorry, it's, a, oh, it's sp2 carbons, aromatic rings, double bonds, carbonyls. But you may not have a strong RCSA for carbons with, CH, with CSA tensors of poor anisotropy. So the anisotropy is defined, and uh, roughly here, like uh, is um, sigma 3,3, three, that is the, the highest, minus the sum, the sum of sigma 1,1 one, one plus sigma 2,2 two, two, divided by 2. So you can check the anisotropies using um, the CST module in MSPIN. But let me show you this. Well, I extracted the, the anisotropies from uh, the, the output file um, from Gaussian. Um, I think that this would be a nice feature to have um, in, uh, in MSPIN on a stereo feature in the future. But see, uh, for example, the strychnine has anisotropies that go, on, these, are, these are in ascending order, that goes from you know, 10 to 180, and you have a nice range of anisotropies. But if 
if you look at strong, you know, strong has several carbons, you know, that with, my, with less than 20, you know, we saw that with less than 20, your maximum RCSA will not be more than 2 hertz. But then there are six carbons, those the aromatic plus the carbonate. So if you really want to do discrimination of all the possible configurations of strong using RCSA, it will not be possible or it will be difficult because you don't have enough anisotropic carbon. For example, in retrorcine that we did it also in the paper, you have a range that goes from 20 to 180. Well, I was so disappointed when I tried to measure RCSAs for artemisinin. I said, what is going on? I got beautiful R R disease, but very poor RCSA. Well, the answer is here. Very poor, poorly anisotropic, anisotropic carbon. Even the carbonyl of um, artemisinin is, uh, is very poorly anisotropic. So then we need to be aware. I'm not saying that you cannot use it. There is limitation and we need to be aware. Um, so a structural value of RCSA. Well, same as RDC, provide information of no local character, provide relative orientation of CSA tensors, can be measured for any type of carbon, even quaternary, provided that the carbon show enough anisotropy. As I show you here, this is what you, what you get. You get the relative orientation of um, a chemical shift tensor. Um, so I just want to show this, and I want really to thank Gary Martin because there are not many applications in the real world how to use RCSA. The first application was done by the group of Merck. You know, uh, I'm not uh, here. Are the author Tom, uh, Thomas Williamson, Yi Su Liu, uh, um, Gary Martin the company from George Calder, uh, John Clardy, is this fungal metabol I call homodimericine. And homodimericine uh, contains 14 quaternary carbons and 11 of them are contiguous. So what they did um, is, uh, I'm not going to describe everything here, but what they used RDCs, but RDCs were not enough and they added RCSAs, and then it would combine in RDCs and RCSAs, they were able to get the correct structure, and that this, this article was recently published in JAX. Um, uh, well, I don't have much time, but here, when, when for example, um, the, the carbon-12 is inverted, the cool factor increases from 0.162, to 0.329. And again, what you are doing here is you are getting the relative orientation of all of the RC, the, the, the chemical shift tensor, and bingo, you get your structure. And something that I want to highlight, another application is this recent paper in Science by our friends from Merck, and in which also they combine RDCs, RCSA, or, well, they did, uh, they did a complete uh, piece of work where they use um, case-based analysis. Uh, this paper came together without knowing each other with the other with Angevante. So, um, and in this paper, um, the group from Merck, again, Jesu uh, Liu, Joseph Sauri, uh, Gary Martin, Thomas Williamson, in collaboration with John Clardy and Hank Kimstra, they put this nice piece of work together and they show, for example, that uh, using a combination of RDCs and RCSAs, they can show that, and that, that the, the, the correction of the structure of um, cryptospirolepine, and, and then you can see that the Q factor is 0 0.122 when you combine RDCs and RCSAs. Another example is this camp on aquatolite, in which, uh, well, there is a nice history behind the aquatolite because there was a wrong structure. I don't want to, you know, um, use much time, much of your time, but you can see here that they, this one, they, 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 there is a gray fitting, you know, the, the red, well, you cannot see these are the screen captures. The red dots are RDCs, the blue dots are RCSAs, and you can see the nice fitting here with a Q factor of 0.12 and then the other Q factor of 0 0.72, 0 0.59, and 0 0.23. And then, so this is proving. So as uh, I like the term coined by Thomas Williamson when they, he says that RDCs and RCSAs are orthogonal NMR parameters. They are sets of really complementary parameters that add new parameters to the, to the play. Um, well, the conclusions are these ones. So uh, I'm thinking that I'm using almost 
so 40 minutes, but accurate RCSAs complement conventional J camplings, NOE, one bond or long range RDCs, data for analysis of relative configuration. Complementary tools are introduced that provide robust means of measuring delta of delta RCSA through stretch and compressed PMMA gels. Uh, well, there are these PMMA beds, so um, let me clarify. Uh, the group of Merck is using um, polyhema gels that are compatible with DMSO. Just keep in mind that in industry, DMSO is mostly used, and also we have DMSO gels for the compression device. So RCSA's measurements have the potential to be more appealing to general organic chemists with limited NMR background than RDC's measurements, since the former are simply measured by the standard 1D carbon-13 experiment with proton decoupling using a routine diet of certain MR probe. As, okay, I don't want to say that in contrast, RDC measure typically require more sophisticated. Today it's easy to measure also RCSA. Now we have this J resolve experiment HSQCs that are pretty beautiful. So, and the acknowledgement, well, um, I always acknowledge Armando Navarro Vasquez. I call he is in fact the, guru, the the computer guru, and he is the driving force behind writing all the software and spin stereo feeder. I am so grateful to have him as a collaborator. So Leandro Gil Silva, working for Metro Lab, and he uh, also has a company Alignment Technology for the gels. Christian Griesinger and Nila Monina. Uh, that did the work with the compression device in the Max Planck Institute in Göttingen. Uh, the, this, this is a group of Merck, good, good uh, colleagues and friends, uh, Yisu Liu, Thomas Williamson, and Gary Martin. And, and also I want to thank the Metro Lab research team, Manuel Perez Pacheco, Carlos Cova, Santi Dominguez, Chen Pen, and, oh, sorry, Mark Dixon is misspelled there. Sorry, Mark, it's Dixon with X. Um, and, and yeah, thank you for your attention and I'm willing to answer questions now.